Welcome back, dear students. Let's now concentrate on developing personal financial goals. When you study highly effective people, successful, whether they're well known or not, what you find is that almost all of them are goal oriented. They have a vision, they have a dream, but then they sit down <laughs> and write out what objectives, what goals, what milestones they have to accomplish to get to that dream, to get to that vision. And so we're going to do that likewise. We're going to learn how to develop effective, well-written, personal financial goals. So let's get started on slide 19. The types of financial goals include those that are influenced by the time frame in which you want to achieve your goals. So before we do anything else, we have to decide what is the time frame, and we'll discuss time frames in just a moment. And we also need to know the need, the priority. Is it very important? Is it not so important? No, oh, I couldn't care less, or urgent. And so we break down our goals into short-term, intermediate-term, and long-term. Now, look at this statement at the end of slide number 19. We want you to internalize this. Notice it's all italic, so it's very important. Financial goals should be realistic, be stated in specific measurable terms. What does that mean? So we know that we've accomplished the goal have a time frame, have a priority, and most importantly, indicate what actions we're going to take. The actions or actions that will lead directly to the fulfillment of the goal. And don't worry, we're gonna go through several examples and we're gonna have you write your own personal financial goals. That's the assignment for chapter one. So slide number 20 discusses the timing. Now, these numbers are, are squishy, fung fungible, uh, 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 fuzzy. You can move it around as you see fit. But in the financial world, we consider short term up to a year or so, eh, whatever that so means. Uh, intermediate term is two, three, four, five years even. And then long term is generally anyth anything longer than five years. Now. They, this is the books and the, and the industry's uh, general time frames. But I take a longer term view because I'm a lot older than most of you. I think if short term is one, two, or even maybe three years, intermediate could be three to five, six, or even seven years, especially if it's a goal to get a down payment for a home. And then long term, 10, 20, 30 years. The, these, these time frames that we see at the top of the, of the slide are more in line with the general consensus within the financial industry, brokerage firms, mutual funds, and the like. The time frames at the bottom that I call mine are not just mine. They are more common in the life insurance industry. So you decide what is short-term, intermediate-term, long-term. Now, if you've, if you've taken accounting, you know that the accountants don't do this. Everything for them is either current, which is short-term, meaning one year. Anything that is more than a year is considered long-term, which I think is kind of silly, but that's what the accountants do. I'm not an accountant. Slide number 21. So let's take a look at an, an example of a well-written financial goal. Pay off the squeegee. I'm sorry, uh, 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 visa, visa, pay off the visa. Balance, 3,500. How did I get $3,500 on the squeeze Well, there was that trip to Cancun. Well, she didn't turn out so well, did she? And then the, and then the car had a baby and our sister had a, needed a new transmission. And then the books, oh my goodness, the books are so expensive. Aren't you glad you're taking the class with zero textbook costs? Is it easy to get $3,500 on, on a credit card? Yeah. Is it easy to get it off? Uh, no. They've stuck their needle in your arm and now they're sucking your blood at 20% or whatever. So we're going to make it a priority to get this thing paid off. 
the time frame is 12 months. So what does that time frame belong to? Most people would say one year. Yeah, one year, uh, short term. What are the actions to be taken? Reduce dating and clubbing to twice a month. You mean we got to stay home on a Saturday night? Cancel the cable service? Oh, no. Oh, well, maybe, yeah, but the mobile phone? No way. How about getting a cheaper plan? Stop buying coffee at five bucks. I'm sorry, six bucks, uh, uh, 10 bucks. Starbucks, stop buying coffee at Starbucks and pay an extra $300 per month. Priority high, urgent. I want this financial monkey off of my back. How would you measure the success of the goal? Well, within a year, if it's paid off, yes, you have, uh, have done your job. Is the goal reasonable now? This is where your judgment comes in, because I don't know if it's reasonable for you. It might be, or others might say, are you crazy? Where am I going to get an extra $300 a month? I'm already playing Trivial Pursuit <laughs> on Saturday nights. You have to decide what is reasonable for you. But I think most people, if they put their mind to it, and we're going to look at where that money can come from in chapter two when we discuss cash flow statements, they could pull this off and get that credit card paid off because those things are the bubonic plague of personal financial planning. Oh yeah. Slide number 22, another financial goal. Save up for a home theater system. The amount needed is $2,000. Wait, is that realistic? Can you get a home theater system for $2,000? Well, not a super high-end model, but you'd be surprised how much electronics have come down. Time frame, 12 months. So again, short term. Actions to be taken. Take a part-time job at Home Cheapo. I'm sorry, Home Despot. Home Depot. And put 150 bucks per month into a special savings account at the bank. Priority, medium. You know, it's not the most important thing, but we'd like to have that theater system working up and working within a year. Would most Americans wait a year? No. They would sign their name on the bottom line of a credit card or some other payment system, and uh, they have to have it now. Yeah, I know. That's the American way, and I don't like it. Oh, they're going to give me 12 months free interest. Right. Did you read the fine print? If you don't pay off the whole thing within 12 months or 6 months or 18 months or whatever the time frame is, they go back to the very first day and tack on the interest they would have charged you. What a scam. Folks, that's... <laughs> The, the saying is caveat emptor, right? Let the buyer beware. Let the buyer be screwed. And uh, that's why the um, we, it's nothing new. Mark Twain said it best, said it well, very 100, almost 100 years, over 100 years ago. We have the best Congress money can buy. Okay, slide number 23. Save for a down payment on a condominium. We need 15, oh, is that enough these days? Oh, just barely. If you're a first time home buyer, and maybe you're going to scrounge up some money from some relatives, the uh, you have good credit, you have a decent job, uh, the real estate agents, the loan officers want to talk to you. Time frame, five years. So intermediate, long term. Actions to be taken. Set up $200 automatic investment per month to be taken from our checking account. And we expect our rate of return to be 7%. Priority high. Now, the question is, is this going to be enough? $200 per month at 7%. We're going to learn how to calculate the future value of this stream of investments today. This is what our ultimate goal, <laughs> no pun intended, is to learn how to compute the future value of a stream of investments. So now, slide 24. This is a non-financial goal. And so in the assignment, we're going to ask you to do some short term, some intermediate term, some long term goals. We're also going to ask you to do a non-financial goal. You decide what the non-financial goal is. Maybe it's to organize your, your finances, your papers. Maybe it's to clean out that closet you've been just, uh, we're thinking about cleaning out. In this case, this was a non-financial goal that I had a long time ago. 
when we had this wonderful, wonderful um, uh, program. It was a one unit class. You got credit for it. It was called the Health Fitness Appraisal. And the professor who ran it has since retired, but it was just wonderful. They would do all kinds of, of uh, uh, lab work and you would get you on the treadmill and get you to pull, do pull-ups and the like. And he said, you know, Piano, Piano, you're doing okay because I, I, I'm aerobic, I ride bikes. But, but he said, you're, you're, you, don't need, you need more upper body strength. I want you to be able to do 15 good push-ups. I said, okay, I could do seven. A good push-up, you know, n n straight up and down, right? And so I set a goal for myself three months, uh, so short term. Start with seven push-ups three times a day, increase by two or three every three or four weeks, and work up to 15 push-ups within three months. Priority medium. You know, it wasn't the end of the world if I didn't do it. I'm, I'm doing okay. Is this goal reasonable? Well, again, you have to decide, or maybe with the help of a professional, a doctor, or, or uh, uh, somebody in the exercise science. We don't call it phys ed anymore. Exercise science department. And for me, it was. I was able to do it. And I was able to do 15 good push-ups. Now, what happened? I had a shoulder industry. In injury. <laughs> industry. Injury. A shoulder injury. I had nothing to do with the push-ups. Something completely different. And so I couldn't do the push-ups anymore. So what I what happened? Right. I went to go, go back to square one after a few months when when the, when, the, when the shoulder wasn't so tender, I was able to work myself back up again. And folks, this is life, right? <laughs> this is life. Some of our goals we're going to attain. Others, maybe not. Who knows? Heartbreak, whatever. And we have to readjust. And then sometimes we have to go back to the drawing board because we got that goal and then it slipped away from us somehow. Make sense? Yeah. And so be kind to yourself. But at the same time... We want you to be motivated and excited about those short-term goals because they give us the motivation and the confidence and the, and the good vibrations of getting going after those intermediate and long-term goals. Now, slide number 25 is an example of what we call checking for comprehension. Some people call it a formative assessment. Is it both you know, fancy academic words or words for, are you getting it? <laughs> is it making sense to you? So, and, and this is an, an example of also the kind of question you'll see in the true false part of the exam, the true false multiple choice part of the exam. Which of the following goals would be the easiest to implement and measure its accomplishment? Spend less so we can save more each month. A. B, save $10,000 for a down payment on a condo. C, save $100 each month to create a $4,000 emergency fund in 40 months by canceling the cable service. Or D, save enough for a $4,000 vacation next year. Now, in the face-to-face -face class, we have these A, B, C, D cards at San Diego State. They have a little button you press. We don't have, we don't have that kind of money. So you, we, we ask the students to, to raise up their A, B, C, D cards. And what you'll find is a lot of people want to pick A. Say, spend less so we can save more each month. Why? Oh, it makes sense. And what's the problem? What's the problem? There's no measurable objective. There are no actions to be taken. There's no time frame. And so A plus B plus D are all lacking. The one that we absolutely hate... <laughs> because it pins us down and asks us to actually do something is C. But that's the best goal. That's the well-written, effective goal. We're going to save $100 each month to create a $4,000 emergency fund in 40 months by canceling the cable service. So there's a measurable goal. 40 months, $4,000, time frame, 40 months, action to be taken, canceling cable service. And a lot of people have already canceled their cable service and are now using just the internet. But before we, in the face-to-face -face class, we used to ask people, how much pay more than $50? How many people more pay than more than $100? How many pay more than $150? And there, we've had people who were paying more than $300 for their cable service. Wow. <laughs> I thought, okay, okay, it's... There are those opportunity costs. What are you giving up by spending 
over 300 hours for 5,000 channels and you only watch two of them. Okay, fine. So it is C. So remember this, folks. Resist the urge to pick A and 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 be squishy and vague. Be specific like C. Tell us exactly what you're going to do, how long it's going to take you, and when are you going to uh, and what are you going to be what is going to be done when you're finished? How are you going to know that you're finished? Cool. And we'll discuss this even more when we get to the assignment. And when you turn it in, I'm going to turn I'm going to turn around and tell you this is vague. Be specific. How long is it going to take you? What actions are you going to take? How are we going to know that? How do we know you've you've met the goal? And we have a rubric for you to look at also. And we would go over it together in the face-to-face -face class, but you're going to do that on your own because this is an online class. But can't, con contact me if you want to go through it together. I'd be happy. And of course, there's a commentary, an audio commentary you can listen, you can listen to. We want you to succeed. We want you to be awesome. We want this to be the best class you have ever taken. Okay, enough. Uh, uh, slide number <laughs> 26. What's the financial goal of most Americans, right? And yes, people, they say, oh, retirement, oh, buy a house, an RV, vacation, uh, to be rich, to be rich, rich, rich. No, no. That's what we say. But our actions speak louder than our words. The financial goal of most Americans is to spend everything that you earn. Right. <laughs> and then spend a little more. <laughs> Most Americans live beyond their means. And if you listen carefully in your household, another household, you might hear this conversation. Honey, can we make it to the next paycheck? Well, we could if you hadn't gone to that day spa with your sister. You bought those golf clubs and we already... What's the most important financial decision you're going to make in your lifetime? Yeah, who you marry. And so be careful. Yes. Um, how do we do it? Well, we know how we do it. It's with credit. I mean, there's an entire army, an entire industry with, with, with thousands of people dedicated to making you spend every dime you have and then go into debt to spend more. Why do we do it is the question I have. Well, <coughs> there are various <coughs> um, hypotheses, you know, keeping up with the Joneses, believing that this is somehow going to make me happy to buy that next thing I just saw on the television that I didn't even know existed, but now I have to have it, and it, I buy it, and it goes in the closet with all the other things that I bought. Yes, we're going to change that, folks. We're going to change that. And with just one little sentence, one four-letter words, we're going to, we're going to infect your psyche because... After today, you can no longer say it. You don't know this. After today, your most important financial goal will be to spend less than you earn. <laughs> now, now you've heard of mantras, right? Maybe you haven't. But they're ideas, they're sounds, they're visuals. Some are even dances and, and gestures. And they're there to, to uh, alter your mood and alter your thinking and, and brain cells. So I'm going to give you four. You decide which one's the most important to you, uh, which one you're going to use. But I want you to burn it into the back of your eyelids when you see that um, sale on that thing that you've got to have that you didn't even know existed. You're going to say, no, 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 I spend less than I earn. Or you could say, I live beneath my means. Don't live within your means. Certainly don't live beyond your means. Live beneath your means. Now, the most effective for most people, is pay yourself first. And we're going to uh, look at this one in detail because this is an action. You pay yourself before you pay anybody else. But my favorite, because I'm a child of the 60s, uh, 1960s, folks, is make love, not loans. <laughs> it started out with make love, not war, and then it turned out to be make beer, not war. So I got make love, not loans, okay? So which one do you like? Whichever one you like, you use it. So when you're in that fab famous, famously, <laughs> excuse me, that fabulously famous French department store, Target, and the woman behind the counter in the red uh, uh, vest says, would you like to put this on your Target card? 
You say, oh, no, no, I spend less than I earn. Or, no, I live beneath my, beneath my means. No, I pay myself first. Or what I do is I say, no, no, thanks. I make love, not loans. And then the woman looks at you and goes, ah, that's funny. <laughs> but no, it's serious. Serious, folks. One of these is going to be your mantra that you're going to use to keep you from overspending. Because what are the opportunity costs of going into debt? We're going to see later on. They're very painful. Slide 28 has the most effective one, in my humble opinion. Pay yourself first. By having the money come out of your paycheck or checking account automatically, most individuals easily adjust to investing. It works like a pay raise, only in reverse. If you go down to the bankruptcy courts, <laughs> you'll see people in very nice clothing making $200,000 a year going through bankruptcy. Now, I'd like to know <coughs> how somebody making $200,000 a year winds up in bankruptcy. Well, it's actually very easy. Spend $250,000 a year while you're only earning $200,000 a year. You're going to wind up in bankruptcy eventually. Uh-huh. So what you'll hear people say is, you know, I'm doing all right. Things are okay. If I just had that 10% raise or an extra $400 a month or whatever, Things would be a whole lot better. Things would be a whole lot better. What happens when they get the raise? They go broke at a higher level. So if you're continually raising your income, but raising your spending, you're on that treadmill that's going to lead you to bankruptcy. Many financial planners recommend saving at least 10% of your income for long-term compounded growth. So you'll hear this over and over again. Some people say you should save more. I mean, 10%, if you start young, is pretty darn powerful, but some people can do a whole lot more. And if you get in that habit of paying yourself first before you pay the target, target card, before you pay Ford Motor Credit Corporation, before you pay the Nike, then the battle's won. Unless the world ends, in which case it doesn't matter where your money is. Nobody said it better, in my humble opinion, than David Chilton in The Wealthy Barber. Now, this book is still out there, folks, but it it's, was written in, in the mid-1980s, so the numbers are all wrong. But the, the concepts are beautiful and perfect, and he has a, a sense of humor that's even worse than mine, which is hard to believe, folks. That's setting the bar pretty low. And so <laughs> David Shelton, I don't know what's happened to him. He was on the circuit for a while. Uh, he's a he's a kind of he's a he's a kind of a goofball like me, but he said it really really well. And here's the scenario: the wealthy barber lives in a small midwestern town, and everyone thinks he inherited his money. But the truth is, no. He started young, investing, slowly, steadily increasing his investments, and now he's in his sixties, and he's you know, semi-retired. He works. He still works, but he winds up giving out advice to um, to uh, to younger folks, financial advice, while cutting their hair. And that's the scenario. So here he is discussing the 10% um, um, say pay yourself first uh, um, mantra. The 10% pay yourself first, uh, what am I saying? <laughs> Solution. It's not that 10% solution. No, it's not the 10% solution. But the, uh, the, the, the process of saving 10% of your salary, 10% of your uh, paycheck, whatever. The magic of compound interest. $30 a month, a dollar a day can magically turn into over a million dollars. And do you know what is more impressive? You know someone who has done it. Roy, our barber, said proudly. 35 years ago, he was 25 years old. I started my savings with $30 a month, approximately 10% of my earnings. I have achieved just under 13% return per year. In addition, as my income grows, my savings rose accordingly. $30 a month became 60, then 100, and eventually hundreds of dollars a month. You three are looking at a very wealthy man. One of my early students only followed the pay yourself 10% first lesson. He bought the wrong life insurance, abused credit cards, overpaid for his mortgage, did not take advantage of his 401k at work, 
and lost all $15,000 of an inheritance <coughs> playing the commodities market. This is a real upbeat, encouraging story, Roy, said Tom. Today, his net worth is $850,000, Tom. 300000 of it is the equity in his house, but the rest is his 10% savings. He did everything else wrong, but, Kathy started, because he had saved 10% of each, each paycheck, invested it for long-term compounded growth, today is in great shape, Roy finished. So do check out the book at the library, or you can get it online for a few bucks. It's, as I said, it's pretty old. And read it and laugh at the bad jokes. Okay, now, there are two methods for calculating interest. We're going to not use this one, but you're probably going to hear about it, so I might as well show it to you. I'm not going to ask you about it, certainly on the exam. But it's called the Rule of 72. It's a quick and dirty way for calculating compound interest. You divide your interest rate or your inflation rate by 72, and that is approximately how long it will take the amount to double. So say you have a 10% interest rate. You take uh, 72 divided by 10, that's about seven years. It'll take about seven years for your investment to double. When inflation was running at about 3% from the mid-1980s until just a few years, just a year ago or so, uh, we take 72 divided by 3 and we get 24 years. So if you go back 24 years before the COVID-inspired inflation spike, darn stupid microbe, um, you would see that prices have doubled in 24 years. And the ones to, to really look at, the prices are cars. Cars follow inflation to almost magically, almost perfectly. Where some other things like computers, no, because their technology is changing all the, way, all the time. Food and fuel are very volatile. They go up and down a lot. Oh, by the way, people are really upset now about gasoline, which every few years they're always upset about gasoline. I say, you want the price of gasoline to go down? They say, yes. I say, stop buying it. They go, what? I say, stop buying it. Supply and demand, right? <laughs> if you stop buying it, the, the demand will go down. The supply will then, if the supply doesn't change, you take, you, those of you who have taken Econ 101, you know what I'm talking about. But people don't want to believe that. They want to say it's the oil company's fault. No, it's not the oil company's fault. I mean, they're raking in the profits because the price is so high. But it's our fault because we're buying it. What am I going to do? Ride a bike? Yes, ride a bike. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, let's continue. I digress. My apologies. Now, there are two ways of calcula calculating interest. Simple interest. We will not use simple interest in this chapter. Don't try to do it on the exam. Interest equals principal times rate times time. We will use it back in chapter, when we get to chapter five. So that's very simple, right? That's why it's called simple interest. If we have $100 and we get 6% in one year, that's $6. So after uh, one year, we'll have $106, $100 principal plus $6 interest. But we're gonna learn in this chapter to use compound interest. Now we use the future value tables so you're going to, we're going to learn how to do those, folks. So, so relax, they're not hard. Uh, all you need is a 99 cent calculator. So if we calculate compound interest, what happens is the next year, we not only earn interest on the original $100, but we earn interest on the interest. That's why it's called compound interest. So $106 times 6% times 1 equals $6.36. And after the next year, woo, 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 you're going to have $112.36. And I know what you're thinking. <laughs> big deal, Piano. Well, it is. It is a very big deal over time. Uh, the story goes that Albert Einstein, the world's smartest man, was once asked, what's the strongest force in the universe? What's the... And he said compound interest. Well, I don't know if that's actually true or not, but it's, it's a cool story. But it is. Let's take a look at how cool it really is for those of us who are younger. When you get to be my age, time isn't on your side necessarily. It's called the time value of money. The increases in the amount of money as a result of interest earned. We're going to learn how to go from the present into the future, the future value. Now it's called compounding, okay? So just so you know, all right, I'm gonna ask you. The 
opposite of that is called discounting. We're going to go from the future back to the present. Huh? What? I, forget it. We're not going to do it in this class. This is just a little sip from the fire hose to let you know this is what we do when we get to the introduction to investments class. And again, it's really not that hard. All you need is a 99 cent calculator. The hardest part is getting over the words discounting. What are you going to the store and they're going to dis? No, no, that's a very different word. It's the same word, but it's a very different meaning. Discounting means to take an amount in the future and bring it back to the present. It's very powerful. And once you get past the words, it's actually very easy. But we're not going to do it, so forget it. Don't worry about it. You're not going to be quizzed on it. Forget it. But this is what we're going to do. Amount now going into the future. The future value of money is the amount to which a sum you invest now in the present will increase based on a specified interest rate and time period. And as we said, it's also called compounding. We can do it for a single amount, a single payment, a lump sum, a lump sum principle. They all mean the same thing. One-time purchase, one-time investment. Or, more importantly for the vast majority of us uh, working grunts, we can do it for a series of deposits, a stream of investments. And it is also called an annuity. But I really don't like using that word because an annuity is also an insurance product, uh, the life insurance companies. And that's it get, get, gets people confused. So we're just going to, I should cross out annuity, just cross it out. But we're, I like the term stream of investments because I like to think of it as a river getting wider and, 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 and bigger until finally it's a huge river going to the ocean. And it starts out as a little stream. You like that? I don't know. You, you decide. Series of deposits is another good word. Or multiple payments, multiple payments. We want you to start investing now while you're early. Now, not, not today, folks, especially if you're you know, still in college and just making ends meet. But by the time you're in your tw later 20s, early 30s, you, you join the, 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 uh, the rat race or whatever you want to call it, the society, the benevolent machine. You're, you're now part of the machine. Uh, start taking some of that money that you get every paycheck and saving it away for the future. Uh, you'll see why in just a moment. Now, here's the, here are the formulas. Don't worry. We don't use these formulas. We use the future value tables, which means just looking up a number. But here are the formulas for you math inclined. And so what you see is that the future value for a lump sum payment, a single payment, a single investment, is equal to the principal times 1 plus the rate to the time. Wait a minute. What, what is that? What are you math fans, what is it called when you put something up here in the air? That's called the exponent. And if you know what an exponential graph looks like, it starts off going very slowly and then all of a sudden, wee, it goes up in the air. <clears throat> yes, that's the exponential graph. And what's the exponent? Time. Time. Yes, the more time we have, the more we get to take advantage of the future value of money. Now, the series of deposits formula is a little trickier, but again, we're not going to use the formulas. I mean, you can if you want. Some of the math, more math inclined people can do that. But we mere mortals just look it up in the table. And there's, of course, an exercise that we'll do in just a moment here. Uh, now, the present value is the opposite. And we, oh, what present value discounting? I don't like those words. I don't blame you. Not only is it harder to comprehend, it's just not as important for personal finance. It is very important when we get to the introduction to investments class. And I've said it before and I'll say it again. The words are more difficult than actually doing the calculations. Doing the calculations is actually very easy once you do them a few times. It's just looking stuff up in a table. <clears throat> now, the formulas for the present value are the inverse formulas for the future value formulas. So look, this it's the same thing except now one plus rate to the time is underneath the, div the div dividend sign, the div division sign. And so instead of going wee up in the air, present value starts up in the air and goes way down. But again, don't drop the class. 
don't worry, we're, we're not gonna do any present value calculations. If you, if this piques your interest and there's still time folks, you can sign up for the Business 123 Introduction to Investments class, take them together. They, they, they're like a hand in glove, they fit together perfectly. And of course you don't even have to sign up for it. All the material is on Wonder Professor. You can just go through it on your own, contact me if you have a little problems. Uh, it's all free for you to use. Very cool. Okay, now, in the face-to-face -face class, we would now pass out the future value handouts and work through them together. Ah, oh well, we don't, <laughs> this is not in a face-to-face -face class. But if you wanna work with me on them, we have office hours. I don't have to wait until, you don't have to wait till the office hour, just make an appointment with me and we'll work them together. But remember that they're out there, they're in Canvas, they're on the wonderprofessor.com website, and there's a there's a the worksheet, there's an answer key, there's a commentary, and then there's a practice worksheet with a you know, so so you could do it over and over and over again. And you're gonna need the future value tables. In the exercises, we find that we talk about some individuals who get a 10% rate of return over 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, 50 years. Excuse me. And one of the things we ask the students, okay, is it realistic to think we're going to get 10% over 30, 40, 50 years? And some students say, I don't know. And other students say, ah, the bank is giving you 1%. Right, yes, that's right. You're going to have to invest prudently with an eye toward long-term growth. And it's not easy at first. At first, it's not easy. If you take this class, and especially if you take the Introduction to Investments class, you'll find that it's really not that hard either. There's an intellectual part of investing, and there's the emotional part of investing. That's the hard part. The, the emotional part, uh, the fear of missing out. The, the greed factor and the fear factor. Uh, people panic when the markets fall. But I want to show you, dear students, that there are investments that have been around for over 50 years that have done more than 10%. Look at this one, 16%. Now, we really shouldn't use We should get rid of this one because that's an anomaly. Don't, that'll never happen again. But where? Look at it. 125 13%. Uh, 12%. So there are investments out there that have done well over 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years. And um, it's not a guarantee of the future. You know, tomorrow, a meteorite could come and destroy humanity, tsunami, World War III. Oh, my goodness, Putin and Xi Jinping. And uh, uh, disco could return. I, I, you laugh, but you weren't there. You, I mean, it was a tough time with disco. There were men walking around in high heel shoes. No, they didn't call them high heel shoes. They, they called them platform shoes. But this, it was still, this was a very difficult time, folks. I know, it's my apologies. But still, yeah, I'm trying to, I'm making light. But it, the world could end tomorrow. There's no guarantees. But this is a pretty good, pretty darn good uh, 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 indicator that as long as we remain optimistic about the future, get up in the morning, put our pants on, go to work, produce the goods and services. Sounds like an advertisement, doesn't it? But I'm sincere. As I told you in the first presentation, I believe the next 20, 30 years, providing we don't blow ourselves up or die in our own waste or whatever, um, yet another COVID comes down the pike. I think the next 20, 30 years are going to be the most prosperous years in the history of the world. And we've got a long way to go until everybody has uh, clean water, healthy food, clothes on their back, place to live. I think so. Cool. Okay. <laughs> now, do those problems because they're going to be on exam number one. And you're when you what happens is when people start doing exam number one, they think they got to use the simple interest rate. No, you don't use the simple interest calculation. We do that in chapter five. In chapter one, we use the tables. So, so go through those worksheets. If you have any questions, you know who to contact 
or uh, go to the, uh, the, the um, Academic Success Center, talk to the tutors. You can do it. We want you to be awesome. Now, when we come back, we have some odds and ends to deal with. Talk about careers and the most important financial decision you will ever make in this lifetime. See ya.